Okay. Okay. I am Steve Ullman, and I have the honor of, of being the president of the Antrim Historical Society. Welcome. Uh, a few preliminary remarks before we get to the uh, the main event. On a on a tragic day, given the Orlando shootings, uh, a depressing day. It is wonderful. It's a wonderful sense of relief that we get uh, to turn to the selfless devotion of our friends and neighbors who have devoted themselves to the families of, of this town and and our neighboring uh, communities. So uh, I'm I'm quite glad to be here. Uh, memberships in the Antrim Historical Society uh, going uh, at an individual membership at the bargain price of ten dollars and. Wait, there's more for a family membership. It's only $20. You can consult with our secretary, Sue Conklin, if you have the $10 or $20. Um, upcoming programs, July 4th. The reading of the Declaration of Independence, which is preceded by the consumption of homemade donuts uh, made by John Robertson. And I think that it... It makes me proud, I don't know about you, to know that the chair of our local select board is the person who makes our homemade uh, donuts for this uh, <laughs> celebration. Uh, for the August program, I have invited John Norris, who is the um, author of a really uh, outstanding biography of Mary McGrory. Uh, for those under 50 years of age, uh, Mary McGrory was a Washington Post columnist and arguably the most prominent woman journalist in the, in the 20th century. She so loved Antrim that if you want to go see Mar uh, Mary, she is buried down here in the Maplewood uh, uh, Cemetery. I am not sure that John Norris' travel plans are going to allow him to, to be present, uh, and I'm looking for another topic in case uh, he, he can't come. Finally, in September, the Antrim Historical Society will once again be offered, offering its often animated, animated, <laughs> imitated, never equaled uh, apple crisp at the Home and Harvest uh, Celebration uh, for reasons that remain obscure uh, to me. This event generates a great deal of anxiety within me. I have to quadruple my anti-anxiety medications in the run-up to this event. So I hope you will stop by and uh, our booth for the vanilla ice cream encased low-calorie apple uh, crisp. On to the topic of the day. The grapevine has filled a critical gap in the family services realm of the Monadnock region. It has filled this gap out of necessity in part because of the New Hampshire political culture, which emphasizes limited government um, and no broad-based state uh, taxes. In 2013, the state of New Hampshire ranked 50th or last in state tax collection per capita. We, Conquered the state capital, demanded the least of us taxpayers of any of the states in the uh, in the union. Our town is very frugal when it comes to social services. In 2015, the welfare appropriation uh, for welfare administration direct assistance was about forty-three thousand dollars. The town only spent twenty-three thousand of that. Uh, so uh, we do not have a full, uh, broad spectrum set of state and local government provided social services. And this is why it was so important that 20 years ago, uh, the grapevine's founding mothers <laughs> and fathers uh, assembled to give birth to this vital community resource. And I could, uh, if, for those of you who read The Grapevine, a small but growing publication edited by Dr. Joan Gorga, who's sitting right there. Uh, there is an entire list of, of, of activities, really a very impressive array. Um, 
At the urging of the chairperson of the board of the grapevine, uh, who was worried that a totally unstructured discussion might run off the rails, I prepared a set of questions, which the panelists may or may not answer. Uh, I have no means of compelling you to answer them. Anyway, uh, on behalf of the Antrim Historical Society, I am delighted to welcome the Grapevine's Greatest Generation. And you can speak in any order that you wish, perhaps with the, your memories of the founding of the, the Grapevine, and then we can move from there. Oh, and I should introduce uh, Ben Pratt, Andrea Gilbert, Kristen Vance, you know, you know practically all of you know every one of these people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, since I well, oh, let's, oh, since not all of us have terrific hearing, we're going to... I can stand with a big voice. Is, is this good for everyone? Yes. Um, I lived in Greenfield for 24 years and now live in Melrose, Massachusetts. Six years ago, we moved um, back to Massachusetts. And my memory of, and I, you know, I looked through um, my files and my notes, and I didn't have anything. <laughs> I think I must have left everything for you of what there was. So uh, my memory is that I was affiliated with the Peterborough Unitarian Congregation and um, uh, uh, well two things happened. One I had a young child I had a, a, a baby, I moved up here with a four month old and was aware of what, um, you know, just being in Greenfield and going to the beach, I was a little surprised at how some of the young children were treated um, ignorantly by their usually mothers. Um, and um, then at the same time there was this, um, I may not be in the chronology, but there was a United Way um, um, move called Success by Six. It was a national United Way project. And I went to a conference, I was working, that's right, I got a part-time job with the Early Intervention Network of New Hampshire, and through that, was getting a lot of literature and <coughs> learning about the gaps in social services for families in New Hampshire, particularly in rural areas, and the fact that there was no kindergarten. And um, so um, we were challenged to go back to our communities and figure out what the gaps were and rally community members to fill them. So, I don't remember how it happened, but, oh, hi, Sid. <laughs> well, you haven't changed either. My goodness. this <laughs> woman. Hi. Joy. As you all know, this is Sidney Wilson-Smith, who has, an abs has been an absolutely vital contributor to the grapevine over the years. Um, so I'm really being long-winded because I'm trying to get my memory going. But what we did was, um, oh right, I had this organization called Families and Communities Together, which we formed sort of organically as a nonprofit to together sit around the table and figure out what we can do to serve families. We first decided to do these parent-child programs, these birth-to-five programs, because there was no kindergarten, and really uh, a whole, not a whole lot of preschool happening around here. And so there were some Unitarian grandmas, actually. Sid was one of them. There were a group of mostly women who volunteered 
to run these play groups. The first one, I believe, was in Antrim. And I don't know whether we met here initially. We may have met here in the education classrooms. And um, we met in the fire station in Bennington. We met in the church in um, Greenfield until I was told they didn't want us because we had a little United Way grant that was paying for play things. And um, there, it was a more fundamentalist church then and there was some religious reading. Uh, anyway, um, and then um, I think Peterborough was last, was the last place we had a play group. Anyway, so it started with these parent-child programs and um, we linked up with uh, visiting nurses. What's it called? The Visiting Nurse Association, that's home health care. Right, and there they had somebody, Lorraine Bishop, who um, was in charge of intake for the parent, the young parents and infants, and she'd refer the, these people to us, and we, you know. So it went on like that, doing these young parent programs, and then um, uh, I don't know at what point we evolved to do um, more um, support for families beyond just developmental stuff. Do you? I think Sydney could probably speak to that. Okay, ma'am. <laughs> Frankly, doubt it. Memory is not my strong suit these days. So, I, uh, I don't know that I could say anything definitive. I just know that... Well, that I certainly didn't. <laughs> I, have, I have scattered memories of tearing around, of, uh, delivering uh, flyers about this, this wonderful new initiative and... Uh, uh, talking about telephone, I'll, I will never forget telling you. You will remember Betty Avery. You all know Betty. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, I was. I remember a bunch of us sitting around a table like this, and you know, well, okay, so what do we do now? And um, so, well, we've got to call some people to be interested, et cetera. So she was on my list. Betty was on my list. I didn't know I'd never met her. And I started to talk to her on the phone, and I didn't get through the first sentence when she was so excited and she would be immediately involved and she was and she stayed involved. Her name is on the, on the, uh, what is, what do you call that room that the kids, the, the children's kids, room. The children's room. Yeah. I can, um, her name is on that because that's, that she, oh, she was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And I'll never forget the enthusiasm with which she greeted that opportunity to be of service to families and children. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Okay, well, the mothers, there were more mothers staying home those days, you know, in those days, perhaps, raising the kids. Who knows? I can't keep track of what the culture is doing. But um, uh, I remember being downstairs. Uh, Kristen, you remember this, probably, because you used to bring some of the flyers and stuff when, back in the day when people would get together here and apply for services, you know? Wick. Wick. That's what it was. You see the memory thing? Um, and, and I would bring flyers, and then I'd go around to the apartment houses and talk, you know, to hand out, hand out pieces of paper for people to know about the initiatives <coughs> were being thought about. So uh, that's mostly what I have is a lot of scattered memories. And at some point or other, we got. Uh, oh, I know. I remember. I remember getting somebody to come and talk with a group of parents um, about from Sophia's Hearth. Someone came from Sophia's Hearth, with, you know, a key in the place for kids and parents and whatnot, and, uh, and someone came from there, and we just, I think it just kind of grew from that sort of thing, well, who would come now, and, and uh, just inviting people to come and talk, and eventually it sort of coalesced into something a little more formal. But I remember being at the Aiken House, and wonderful discussions, and the thing that's so thrilling to me is I can still see kids, you know, this, this big now, that were... <laughs> that were so tiny when we started, and it's just, it never stops being thrilling to me, this, this kind of life and the energy that, that, that we can all bring to whatever we're passionate about. And, uh, 
Yeah, it was marvelous. It was a fabulous opportunity. Oh, so, a lovely thing. So there were a few steps before we got to the Aiken House. I think that was before yeah. we did. Yeah. We, I remember Ben and, um, um, what's the guy who used to do the Developmental Disabilities Commission? Anyway, there were a few people from Antrim who um, I knew from um, both my work in disabilities and, again, the Unitarian Congregation. Bob Gordon Allen. Allen. Yeah, Gordon oh. Allen. Whom I invited, but it's, is at the lake. Yeah, Bob Burns. Oh, no, am I supposed no, to use No, this? I was going to give it to I the band So was... what I remember, you can hear me about that, right? What I remember is having meetings on the floor, first in the library in Antrim, and then we rented, I got a grant, a planning grant, and then we rented uh, two storefronts right. on Main Street in that one floor building, mm -hmm. and I remember having a bunch of people sitting on the floor, because we had no furniture, right, right. planning what we were going to do. And, um, <coughs> And then it, that space didn't hold us for very long. That's when we began a bunch of parent-child programs, and you were there, and Betty Avery was there. Right. And um, I think, uh, and then once we moved, you wrote the nonprofit application, right? Yes. Yeah. So. Then, you know, the grant writing started in earnest, and then um, you were hired as our first real director. There was a group, though, um, that you, I think, that you two were both a part of, and others. Um, pennies. The Pennies. Carolyn. Oh, right. That met right, right. With, right. with you, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was the core group of... What, I think that's really interesting a really interesting part, and I've only talked about it and talking about the history very uh, sort of generally because that's really all I know, that I sort of six or eight people getting together, six or eight people getting together with Andrea from Families and Communities Together to talk about um, what the opportunities were in Antrim to further develop the right. parent-child program. In fact, it was Dottie Penny who named it the grapevine. Oh, okay. Really? Yeah. Good. Um, do you remember anything of those <laughs> meetings? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was Betty. It was Betty Avery that named it. Oh, really? I remember being at this table. Okay. We won't we argue that point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that it wouldn't be lovely if Dottie Penny had done it. That was per perfectly acceptable. But I remember Betty just popping out with that. We were, well, what could we call it, you know? And she just popped out with that, and we kind of went, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it was Betty. I remember okay. being there. Ben, do you have... Memories you want to share? Uh, I remember the, the first, uh, well, yeah, it's interesting. The, obviously, quite a lot had been going on before I ever uh, was even aware of, of uh, what was happening. There was, a, there was an organizational meeting uh, in, the, uh, in the storefront that Andrea had mentioned. And, uh, that was uh, my first contact with it. I, I went there for kind of an organizational meeting, and my, my sister Judith was still living, and the two of us went to that together. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were both very impressed with, with the ideas. And uh, so I, I guess I've been involved to some degree ever, ever since. Uh, I've been primarily involved with the, with the facilities uh, portion of the, of the uh, uh, undertaking and and um, uh, we uh, I, I, I started to become more involved uh, when uh, the Aiken house not the Aiken barn where we are now but the Aiken house on Main Street which is no longer there uh, and we we did quite a lot of work uh, preparatory to, to moving the organization from the storefront uh, to the uh, to the Aiken house and one of Steve's questions um, uh, he said uh, if you could go back in time and change a single event in the history of the grapevine what would that be 
And uh, uh, I've, I've got a, a straightforward answer for that. Uh, we uh, we uh, applied for and got a community development block grant. Um, to, uh, and the purpose of the grant was to refurbish the Aiken house uh, and, and make it into the permanent home for, for the grapevine. And so the first thing we did, we, we went out and engaged an architect and spent a substantial amount of money uh, to redesign the Aiken house. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, uh, the, the plans were completed. Uh, uh, Mr. Penny did a tremendous amount of work uh, uh, working out the details with, with the uh, uh, architect. And uh, it went out to bid. And there was only, we only got one bid. Uh, it was by the contractor who did the work on the, on the refurbishment of the, of the Antrim Town Hall. And the bid was for something like three or four times what the total amount of the development block grant was. And uh, so at, at that point, it very rapidly became obvious that the Aiken House was simply not going to work. And the, the sad thing was we, we, we had now spent all this money uh, with the architect, and, and that was really just money that as it turned out, had been thrown away. Uh, at the same time, the Aiken barn became available. And uh, so uh, we formed a nonprofit co uh, co uh, corporation and uh, uh, got a mortgage and purchased the Aiken barn. And then we had to apply to the state. And we got the, we got the remaining amount from the development block grant that we had previously obtained, we got that transferred to the Aiken barn, and we used the remainder of those funds to, to redo the, the barn. Uh, we weren't, there, there just wasn't enough money uh, to do everything that we needed to have done, but we did get it to the point where the grapevine could move in and operate, and they've been there ever since. What aspects of the history of the grapevine are you most proud of? What would you brag to people about it? And if you were braggers, which you're not, but <laughs> what's been most fulfilling about how the grapevine has evolved over the years? I'm most proud that it exists at all. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. You all heard that. <laughs> I'm proud of quite a bit um, about the grapevine. Um, and some of it's, most of it, is here in this room. Just about everybody here has participated in the grapevine in some way or, or other. Um, and we've been able, over the years, to attract a really amazing staff. Um, and so that's something I feel very proud about. Um, and I think that culture was really created from the, from the seed. Um, it was a very organic, as Andrea said, beginning. And all of the programs that developed um, from the very first parent-child program developed organically. Um, and by that, I mean that um, it, was, it was opportunities and um, something that people participating in programs or people in the community saw as um, something that they wanted to, um, to realize. Um, the parent-child programs grew into more parent-child programs. Those, in turn, started the Learning Find Preschool because there were parents in the, the parent-child program who wanted something next for their children who were getting older and ready for preschool. And so at, at the, the um, teen center uh, developed because of the Brown Bag Coalition getting together and talking about youth in town and before and after school gaps 
and bringing those teens in to develop. They actually, there's, there's like 30 teens that got together over a period of about nine months. Um, every couple of weeks, um, they weren't all there every time, but Carol, there were like a dozen kids there probably um, most of those um, afternoons where Carol helped to lead some sort of um, uh, activities to help these teens envision what the teen center was going to look like and then build it. So I'm really proud of the fact that the growth of the grapevine came from within the grapevine itself, people participating, but also from the, from the community. Well, I, re I remember I have uh, I remember when we had uh, one or two years when we had uh, we had a group a social group a sort of play group for was it junior high kids mm -hmm. girls mm -hmm. I don't know why it didn't sustain but it went on to influence the teen center I'm sure but I remember that um, very well I don't think I was part of the, the uh, you know the facilitators that you remember that, Carol? Do you have any recollection of that? I do. <laughs> do you? Yeah. Um, but I also think about the the uh, the birth stages of the of the um, discussions with families about uh, parenting and about child development and all that sort of stuff. I, I remember that we would look odds and ends of us to parents with little kids and uh, sitting around on the floor and on the over there in the, the storefront and. Um, I remember thinking, what, well, what are we, <laughs> how are we going to make this work? And I had, I had friends from, um, I worked at Division for Children, Youth, and Families for 17 years, and, and was just beginning to, this was just beginning to evolve when, uh, when I was retired, so I kind of, kind of just leaped right into that stuff that was going on in the upstairs of the library, and, uh, and some real energy that, that Andrea got, uh, got, gave birth through there. And, um, but I think about those first, uh, those first times of sitting around with uh, a few, few parents and, and their kids, and I would invite people from my, uh, from my Keene uh, district office time that, that had a lot of information about child development and, uh, and all this kind of thing, and they would come down and sit around and talk with us. So that was the, sort of the beginning of how it evolved to do some, some, uh, some parenting education and talks and uh, uh, about the challenges of parenting small kids and all that sort of stuff. But I remember, I remember that well. I can still see some of those young adults that were toddling around and their parents that are still near and dear. Um, so I, re I remember that as being one of the, one of the, whatever you want to call it, transition times because I certainly wasn't, wasn't uh, come with a hat on that was uh, prepared to prepared to do parent education, but it, it but it, it evolved, and there were always so many um, so many people to draw from that could come and talk. and And I remember being uh, down here, Krista. I remember Kristen being down the stairs when they were doing those wick things, and, and and bringing some toys and playing with kids out in one of the back rooms. And so it was that kind of energy that just eventually coalesced and made a something that looked like a. Andrew, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, as you're talking, I'm also thinking that remembering that one of the things we talked about was supporting um, young families who may have been in transition, didn't know a lot of people in the community, and um, families who were really struggling economically and socially, and that that required special outreach and special handling and that had to be a very conscious thing that we did to figure out how to include those families in the work we were doing and to, what's so beautiful about the grapevine about these programs is that you can have all different kinds of people in there at the same time and it's an equal opportunity um, program, you know, you, you, and it's so important for people to learn about each other and from each other. 
and learn to support one another. I think that continued. Is that correct? Oh, yes. And <laughs> the, day, the day that I interviewed for the position, uh, the interview took place in the Aiken House, which was under renovation. And I clearly remember people um, working, um, painting, um, cleaning. And I remember Sydney was doing that, and she was also there. There were at least a couple of people who came in who had, had needed to talk with you for some reason. Um, and you know, so you stopped your work, and you brought them into a, a, the, the front room that was a lot more comfortable and somewhat um, respectable, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and met with them for a while. And so it was just the, the, the energy that I felt, even, <laughs> even though what I faced was like, 12 people in a circle. This was my in the interview panel. It was like twelve people, and, and, video. and I was videoed. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> we never looked at that video. No. no. <laughs> um, in spite of that, <laughs> it was a very welcoming feel coming into coming into the grapevine that first time. Even though um, the the uh, the digs were not uh, what what you might hope for. And one of the impetuses for the grapevine that I think probably was in the grant writing was the fact that social service providers, all different kinds, were delivering services in Antrim and Bennington and Francistown and Hancock, but they didn't have a place. They were delivering services out of their cars, and they weren't connected with one another, and it seemed like time, I mean this goes back to the poor infrastructure here, you know the services were in Keene, Concord, whatever other cities there are in New Hampshire, I forget at this point, but um, it gave them um, a place to deliver all these services which was helpful to local people. Yeah, I, one of the things I, I, I don't know if this is, if this is still um, if this still happens or not, but I remember a time when um, parents who had uh, who had lost their uh, uh, let's see what's, what what I say they had, had they had to have supervised visits mm. and um, and that happened at the grapevine and I was elected partly because I'd been in the in the field of child protection stuff so I was uh, elected to be the person that would oversee the visits that was so moving to me. Yeah. And I felt, I feel still now how grateful I was to be able to be respectful of, of the children's needs and and um, and the uh, the absent parents' needs, and then the, when they got together at the end of the playtime, and um, that that was very moving to me. There was something else that was too, but of course it's gone out of my head right now. But um, yeah, it was quite and out of my head. Pride, and you want to say anything about pride and programs you don't have to. Well, uh, as I mentioned, I, I've been 